Good evening. My name is Jim Harris, and I'm president of Widener University. And I want to welcome everybody to this evening to Latham Hall. And on behalf of the Widener University Board of Trustees and the Askin Leadership Institute, I want to welcome you to the 2012 Voices of Leadership Dinner. Since this evening is about leadership, I think it's appropriate that I might pause just for a moment and introduce some of the leaders on our Board of Trustees at Widener so you're aware of those individuals. And please hold your applause until I have them all rise. First of all, the chair of the board, uh, Nick Trainer, is the class of 64. Vice chair of the board is retired General John Tulelli, class of 63. Past chair of the board, Dr. David Oskin, class of 64. Uh, trustee and chair of our campaign, Mr. Tom Bound, class of 67. And I saw Brian Tierney was here earlier. Can we give them a round of applause and thank them for their leadership? I won't take the time to introduce everyone, but I would like to just introduce two other groups if they would rise and be recognized. First of all, I know we have a number of guests. We're going to be hearing from uh, Dennis Mullenberg in just a moment, but I would like to uh, have all of our friends from Boeing who are here this evening. I know we have a number. Will you please rise? And that's welcome them. Thank you for being here this evening. And then finally, I'd like to recognize those individuals who serve in senior leadership positions at the university. So will the members of the senior leadership team please rise? These are, these are de academic deans and vice presidents of the university. Would you please rise and be recognized? We established this annual dinner to provide the university community with an opportunity to hear directly from inspiring leaders across different disciplines in a variety of fields. Last year, we had the good fortune to hear from Mr. Joe Neubauer, CEO of Aramark, and his fascinating life story, and he shared it with us. This evening, we look forward to gaining insights from another inspiring leader, Mr. Dennis Muhlenberg, President and CEO of Boeing Defense, Space, and Security. Dennis, we are honored to have you here this evening. We're looking forward to your conversation with General Tulelli later on. So at this time, please enjoy the company at the table and enjoy your meal. We'll be back up here in a little bit. Thank you. Well, I have the great honor this evening to introduce Mr. David Oskin. Uh, David is, the, is a graduate of Pennsylvania Military College, now Widener University from the class of 1963. I had the good fortune when I accepted the job at Widener University to have him as chair of the Board of Trustees. Uh, during his time as chair, uh, Widener had made significant changes. We, he was instrumental in helping us to design and develop our new mission statement and our vision, and also a strategic plan that was a 10-year plan that we will finish in 2015. He's a generous benefactor of the university and also the reason that we now have the Widener Oskin Leadership Institute, which opened last fall. Due to his experiences at the Pennsylvania Military College and here at Widener, Mr. Oskin and his wife, Joellen, and their late son, David, wanted to support the university by helping to expand on what we would consider the key principles of a Widener education, which have always been the principles of an education here at this institution, one of the key ones, and that is leadership. Today, the Oskin Leadership Institute supports Widener's longstanding tradition of leadership development, and will help us strive towards being a world-class leadership institution recognized for innovative leadership programs and the opportunities for students to lead outside of their comfort zones. Please welcome Mr. David Oskin. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you here this evening. And Jim, I want to say thank you for the, inter the kind introduction. But I also want to say that uh, this fall, Jim has been with the university now 10 years. And all you have to do is look around you to the physical plant. You have to look in terms of what this university has accomplished on the program side, on the service side. And you can see his handprint everywhere. Your accomplishments have been great. I have every reason to believe they will continue. And for all that, we thank you. Uh, 
Now, Jim mentioned that uh, I attended Pennsylvania Military College. I uh, ended up on campus in August of 1960. And at that time, I was referred to as what a, a, a rook, which was one of the lower things in the world. And I came here to obtain a quality education. But I also came here to be a cadet in the gray line of Pennsylvania Military College. Most importantly, I wanted to graduate with a degree, and I had a great desire to be a second lieutenant in the Army so I could serve my country. I remember on that first day in August, uh, walking upstairs uh, behind Old Main in an area that is now happens to house Jim's office and uh, a number of the administrative offices. And they put all the rooks together in the room, and uh, I happened to glance up on the wall, and there was a plaque. And the plaque, uh, and some of you have probably heard and maybe even read this plaque, was from Colonel Hyatt, attributed to Colonel Hyatt. And it said, uh, when wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. But if character is lost, all is lost. It had a profound effect on me, and it has all my life. And I think about where I am in my life and what I've been able to do, the experiences that I've had. I owe an awful lot to Pennsylvania Military College and today Widener University. Once I left the university, and um, I did understand that, uh, uh, that tomorrow belongs to uh, what, uh, uh, what we do today. So I went out in the world, uh, had a lot of good fortune, I met a lot of neat people, mentors that looked after me. And I came back in the middle of the 90s, and at that point, I felt it was my time to start giving back to the university from which I graduated. I had been a first generation student, and uh, so what I was really interested in is for first generation minority students in helping them. Uh, I was able to get through on national defense, defense loans, but I felt it would be a great thing if I could help other people, and so we established for my son uh, the Stephen Ross Oskin uh, scholarships. Following that, in the late 90s, I was approached to become a member of the, uh, of the Board of Trustees, and I was honored, and I accepted. And as Jim indicated a few minutes ago, I was very fortunate to be involved in the hiring process of Dr. Harris. And an awful lot has been accomplished, as I mentioned before, in terms of under Jim's tutelage. And I started at that point thinking that, wow, we're all about leadership here at Widener University, just like we were at Pennsylvania Military College. And then in 2007, I was asked to address the graduating class. And in addressing that graduating class, uh, I tried to describe what the input I had and what my observations were about Widener graduates whether they came from Pennsylvania Military College or whether they came from Widener University in terms of their degree. The first word that came to mind was grit. Not a word that you might typically hear in terms of college, from, about college graduates, but Widener students, when they leave, they graduate, they go out there, they truly have grit. Now, then my encouragement to that class was also to continue to strive for excellence in everything you do, apprentice to be excellent in all you undertake. I encourage them to go and explore and get some global experiences. Get, their, get perspectives of others. You may not agree with everything, but listen and learn. So being global in your thinking is so, so important. And I said also, you should do what you can do to help maintain our democracy. 
And the, th the last thing I said was that uh, you shouldn't be afraid to take a risk. And remember that uh, no one ever stubbed their toe by walking backwards. The fact remains that you need to get out there, you need to take a chance, you need to take risks, and you need to get out of the things that are comfortable to you. Get out of your comfort zone. Because at the end of the day, uh, you won't always be right. But also remember that good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. So don't be afraid to take a risk. And those were some of the messages that uh, I conveyed back at that time. And all along, I'm thinking that, wow, this is a university that really has a leadership tradition. And then I was approached by Dr. Harris, that say, said to me, David, he says, I think it's time you step up and you do something. And so we had long conversations and also with some of my colleagues that were on the board. And my family and I, Joellen, and our late son, David, decided that what we would do is make a gift to establish a leadership institute, institute here at, uh, at Widener University. Because Widener University, and Jim mentioned the st uh, strategic plan, it's a great plan. We've moved beyond plateau to plateau, and there's more to climb. But we are making U Widener University, clearly, all of us together, uh, and students, faculty, administration, board, making this just one fantastic university that will be recognized not only here in this nation, but around the globe. And so I think that uh, what I'm conveying is that at the heart of Widener University is the same heart that existed back at Bullock School for Boys back in 1821. And if you think about it, we're pretty close to celebrating 200 years of leadership. And you think about Pennsylvania Military College. The fact is we have an awful lot to offer the world and through the Oscan Leadership uh, uh, Institute, we hope to be able to accelerate and move things along. Giving our students here, giving international students, giving managers and executives outside of Widener the opportunity to work on their personal and leadership development. This is really to perpetuate the long-term tradition of, of Widener. And I had the opportunity here, uh, I'm gonna guess maybe a month or so ago, to come here one Saturday afternoon and to spend some time with the first cohort of uh, Oscan scholars, 16. There actually were 12 there that day. Um, and I listened to them and they made presentations of what their ideas were and how they were going to really demonstrate leadership in the world. Dan, who's here tonight, talked about world hunger and his ideas in terms of vertical farming and whatever could be done, and he intends to form a business to go ahead and do that. And I remember Shaughnessy talking about, really, she's going to develop and build a home or acquire a home in Philadelphia to help support unwed mothers. Matter of fact, I think there are a number of uh, the Oscan scholars here tonight. Would you please stand? Let's give him a hand. So let me just uh, close by saying, as I observed in, in, the, in the first year of operation under Dr. Schwartz's leadership, there have been an awful lot of accomplishments. And, uh, we had a, had a program also for training uh, 12 uh, international uh, Chinese managers from a Chinese company here uh, spending the morning in English in the afternoon learning leadership development and many, many other things that uh, Arthur has uh, been able to uh, bring about in the first year. But the thing that struck me as I sat in that room and I listened to those 12 individuals was I looked at them and I thought, well, you know, they don't have on Cadet Gray, but they sure sound a lot and act a lot like the people that I went to school with. 
They're real leaders. They're training to be leaders. And we're very fortunate to have them. And I have to say that uh, I'm much encouraged. And I appreciate the opportunity to be able to go ahead and help move leadership as a centerpiece at Wander University. So thank you very much. Now, if you would, Dr. Schwartz, are you? I'm sure you're here, but I can't see. <laughs> uh, this, is a, this is a true gentleman here, and he, inside and out, and it's been a pleasure working with him. He is, uh, came to us from the Air Force Academy, and where he was a senior scholar, leadership, and um, before that, uh, worked with the uh, Templeton Foundation. So he's accomplished on the business side, he's accomplished on the academic side. We're pleased to have you here. Your turn at the podium. Thank you. Thank you, David. And it truly is an honor to be completing my first year here at Widener University. It is my privilege to introduce the host uh, for tonight, General John Tilley. He asked me to just say that he is a retired soldier. But I would be remiss if I didn't share with you that when David Oskin came to PMC all those years ago as a rook, there was an upperclassman who told him how to have his heels locked. And as somebody at the Air Force Academy or any of the military people here, you know what that means. And that's, that's a piece of wisdom that, that was good then, and it's a gift that's kept on giving to David in all these years. So please join me in welcoming to the podium the host for our evening tonight, a retired soldier, John Tilley. Thank you, uh, Arthur. Uh, I want to thank all the Boeing folks uh, here tonight. I want to thank Dennis for taking time out of a truly busy schedule. You know, for those of you that know, don't know what Boeing does, and if you don't know what the philosophy of Boeing is, and Dennis's personal philosophy, it's to provide the very best to our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, who are our sons and daughters, the 1% of America who go out and fight the nation's wars. And that's why it's important that Dennis chose to speak to us tonight. It has nothing to do with the large corporation. It has to do with their mission, their intent, and how they execute it. And the leadership associated with Boeing and the people here, the fact that they make the finest equipment for our sons and daughters, that's more important than anything else that they can do, and that's their philosophy. So I thank them for that. It's my great honor to introduce our 2012 Voices of Leadership honoree, Mr. Dennis Muhlenberg. He's the president and CEO of Boeing Defense, Space, and Security. Something I learned tonight, he grew up on a farm. Something we have in common. As all of us, he had times in his life when he overcame challenging issues. And I hope we'll talk about that tonight and some of the issues that he's had to face. And as our sign says, he's had the courage to make a difficult decision that helped him realize full potential, not self-actualization because he hasn't gotten there yet from my perspective. He's a true friend. I've known him for a long time. The experiences that he has have resulted in powerful insights that help our current, can help our current leaders. And it's interesting, I got a little factoid tonight because I asked the question, how many of our Widener students are working for Boeing here at Ridley Park? 500. 500. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And I congratulate Boeing's, I guess I would say their insight in hiring such great students here from the Widener University. Jim, Jim told me to say that.
Mr. Muhlenberg is an outstanding example as he quickly made his way through the ranks in Boeing. And he now heads a $32 billion defense sector as one of the youngest business presidents, CEOs in our nation. $32 billion. In probably the most challenging time in our defense his history, we're going through a tipping point now. We're look, people, folks are talking about fiscal cliffs. Folks are talking about the acrimony on Capitol Hill. These are the challenges that he faces and the, the folks who produce these great products every day and the decisions that he has to make. He makes strate strategic decisions that balances growth and competitiveness. That takes real leadership. His overarching focus has been, and you can see that with the, with the people that I know that work for him and with him, is to develop outstanding leadership and be the face to the customer. And the, his customer are not only the gurus at the Department of Defense, but his customer are the young kids who we send into battle. And that's the focus and that's the leadership that we think about. He leads 60, a 61,000 person business sector. And besides doing all that in his free time, he gives back in other ways. One, he's a member of the board of Council of Trustees of the Association of the United States Army. He serves on the National World War II Museum, the Washington University, the St. Louis Science Center Board of Trustees. He's an, an associate fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics and a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society. So he, he does spend his free time giving back. And that, that's his, his philosophy, and I know this, is me plus one can make a difference, and he makes a difference. He epitomizes the, the founding values of Pennsylvania Military College and Widener University and the Oscan Leadership Institute that strives to perpetuate in these young men and women, not only these scholars, but throughout the university, the long and noble tradition of, of courage, competence, and character, the first word, character. You know, it always reminds me of that movie uh, with, uh, and I don't remember the stars, I know Richard Gere was in it, was an officer and gentleman, and he was going through flight school, and his name was Mayo, and he was laying on the ground after doing 100 push-ups, and he was in the mud, and the drill sergeant said to him, why, do you, why are you here? You don't belong here. And Mayo said, all I have is flying. And the sergeant said to him, it's not a matter of flying, it's a matter of character. And that's who we have here, a man of character and wisdom, a man leading a large defense sector. Dennis epitomizes those things that I think of when I think of a leadership. He's calm. He's courageous in making tough decisions. He's a man of strong values and he has strong devotion and patriotism to this great nation of ours. So in that context, he'd be a leader that I would follow in the battle or I'd follow in the business. And with that, uh, I ask that you give uh, Mr. Muhlenberg, Dennis Muhlenberg, a friend, a colleague, a warm welcome here tonight. Thank you very much. I, I guess the first thing I would ask you, and you know, although this is supposed to be very formal and everything, I'm not going to try to stump the chump tonight at all. <laughs> I, was t I was told by some of your colleagues that I should ask you very tough questions, but I'm, uh, <laughs> I I'll give you their names after this tonight. Please do. Please but, do. Yeah. But, but, but the fact is, could, could you tell us what kind of led you to the defense sector? How did you get there? What was your background and upbringing? I, I think that's important that we all understand that. Well, thank you, and I appreciate that. And 
Again, I want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here tonight and for the investment in leadership that this represents, the Askin uh, Leadership Institute here. What a wonderful idea. And uh, General Tolelli, I have to say that's probably one of the kindest uh, introductions I've ever had as well. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, I want to thank you for your leadership and uh, all that you've done for the country. Thank you. A fine man. So thank you for that. Uh, my, my background, as you mentioned, I, I grew up on a, on a farm in Iowa, and I think uh, you know, one of the leadership principles that my uh, father instilled in me early on was uh, the value of hard work, uh, the value of integrity in what you do. And um, growing up, I always had a passion for, uh, for uh, things that flew and had a, an interest in airplanes and space. And uh, combining that with uh, a desire to do something significant, something that affected the globe, something that was uh, important to our country, and to be able to do it with uh, hard work and integrity, uh, all of that kind of led me to, uh, to the aerospace industry and the defense industry as a career. And uh, it's just something that resonates with me in terms of being able to do something that really matters uh, to the country and to the world. And uh, we talk a lot at, about it at Boeing that there are very few companies where you can really make a difference in the ability to connect and protect people around the world and to do something that really matters to our country and knowing that lives depend on what you do. Um, you know, all of that I think is part of what resonated with my background and, and kind of led me to this industry. Well, thanks, that, that, that's great insight. I guess uh, both David and, and Jim Harris talked about mentorship tonight, and yeah. as, as one of the youngest leaders in our defense industry today, and, and one of the largest sectors that transcends uh, not one service, but all services, c can you kind of tell us how mentorship play, played in, in your successes as you moved up the ranks? And as you think about it, uh, can you talk a little bit about your role models in and out of business that sort of you focused on and you know, you have role models, some are good, some are bad, yeah. that, that, that lead you to do certain things. Can you talk about mentorship and your role models, if you would? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I was very fortunate early in my career to have a couple of mentors who took that responsibility seriously. And I, I still remember my uh, hiring manager at uh, Boeing, his name was uh, Fred May. And uh, he, uh, he mentored me as a summer intern uh, he helped me see the opportunities uh, that were, were possible. Early in my career, uh, for about the first five years, he gave me opportunities to rotate, see different parts of Boeing. Really got me excited about the possibilities and taught me a lot about how, what it meant to be, uh, to be a, a businessman and to be involved in serving our customers. And uh, he went out of his way to put me in tough assignments early on, to stretch me, grow me, forced me out of my comfort zone, as you mentioned. Um, I found that to be really, really valuable. And uh, I've been fortunate throughout my career to have uh, mentors who have, have taken that responsibility seriously and have given me a chance to go try things where I might fail and to put me in really tough stretch assignments and uh, uh, give me an opportunity to grow. And I think I've learned a lot about how important it is as leaders to invest in the next wave of lead leaders as a result, and the importance of mentorship. And uh, as a leader uh, at Boeing, I think there's no more important thing I can do than to invest in that next wave of leaders and to take individual responsibility for mentoring and passing on what we've learned and giving people an opportunity to stretch and grow, taking a chance on people. I, I, I think that, that certainly epitomizes what leadership is all about, helping people succeed so there, there is a succession plan, yeah. and you can move them out of their comfort zone. At the, at the same time, as you think about other than Mr. May, were there, are there other role models, yeah. internal or external, to, to the business that you looked at, either historical figures or people yeah. inside of Boeing? Well, there's a good couple of individuals, and uh, I'll, I'll be a little uh, aerospace-centric here, but uh, one of the previous leaders of Boeing, his name was uh, T.A. Wilson, and uh, he was the CEO of Boeing, uh, uh, during the time period where Boeing transitioned uh, into the commercial jet age and was one of the individuals that was involved in a, just a monumental change to the company as jet engine technology was introduced and Boeing took a huge bet on, a, on creating the 707, the first 
uh, commercial jet in Boeing's fleet. And uh, the courage that that took. He happened to be a, an Iowa State grad, as, as I was. And in fact, I had uh, his scholarship at Iowa State, which was one of the reasons I end up, ended up going to Boeing. And so I read, I read a, a lot about him. And I was always impressed with his courage and his foresight and his, just his passion for customers and being on the leading edge of technology. Uh, fascinating, fascinating man. And then another one that comes to mind just recently uh, uh, passed away, Neil Armstrong. And uh, I had the, the privilege of meeting Neil a few times. And uh, those of you that have met Neil, I've, I've never met a more humble man. So here you are sitting with the, the first man to walk on the moon. And uh, boy, he would, he would not tell you that unless you pried it out of him. And uh, this is a man that just had incredible courage. I remember him tell, talking to me about the first Apollo mission that he was on, that uh, if you added it up mathematically and all the engineering approaches that we use today, he and his crew had less than a 50% chance of returning to Earth alive on that mission. So imagine the courage that it took, the raw skill. You talk about competency, right? This, one of the reasons that mission was successful is his raw piloting skill to put a, put a capsule on the moon uh, with a computer that probably has less horsepower than my watch does today, right? Uh, just an incredible man, a very humble, but an extraordinary, extraordinary leader and a, a real visionary. So th those are a couple of uh, no, individuals that I admire. They're, they're tremendous uh, examples. And, and in, in Neil Armstrong's case, it was not only moral courage, it was physical courage, yes. knowing that his chances of coming back were not great. Yeah. And in, in the business that we do every day, it's, it's generally moral courage. And yeah. we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Knowing, knowing you a while anyway, I know that you're a very positive person. Uh, you're a half full rather than half empty uh, individual. So in that context, can you, can you kind of describe what difference it, it means to stay positive rather than look at the negative side? Yeah. Well, I, I think as a leader in a, in a challenging environment like the one we're in or any environment that's challenging, if, if uh, as a leader you have to be able to inspire others to achieve things that otherwise they might not, may not think they could, uh, could achieve. And, uh, you know, it's got to be balanced. Um, being a glass half full without being realistic is not being a good leader either. It's not responsible. Uh, so I, I like to think about it as being realistically optimistic. Uh, but at the same time, you've got to be able to lean forward and, and maybe see around the next corner, encourage people to strive harder, do something that they didn't think was possible. And, and having that inspiration quotient, I think, is an important part of being a leader. And sometimes that's from behind, encouraging the team. Sometimes it's stepping out ahead. But it's always done with the idea that uh, a team who's inspired to achieve more than individually they, they thought they could achieve, as a team, they can do tremendous things. To me, there's nothing more exciting than uh, being a leader who can help create that kind of inspiration and then just watch a team accomplish things, and when they accomplish it, be able to say, wow, I didn't, I didn't think we could do that. How about just amplifying a little bit and describe your definition of what an inspiration quotient is? That's, that's a, a neat concept. Yeah. Well, I, th I think it's the ability to inspire uh, whether things are going your way or when the, when the chips are down. I like to think about, as we evaluate leaders, I, I really like to test leaders on how they treat their people uh, when things aren't going their way. Yeah, it's pretty easy to lead when things are going well. Uh, but in our business, when things aren't going well, how do you treat your people? And can you be inspirational when things are just not going your way? And uh, how do you, do you treat people with the respect that they deserve? Do you maintain your character and integrity under pressure? Uh, I think that's part of having an inspiration quotient. And, and part of it is, is being willing to take a risk. I mentioned earlier tonight, right? It's, it's not taking you know, foolish risks, but it's taking risks and stretching and being willing to put it out there and know that you may not always succeed, uh, but it's, it's important that we stretch and that we, we create the opportunity for others to stretch. I think that's part of it. No, that's a, that, that's a great definition. And I think that goes to something you're, you, you said earlier, and that had to do with being pushed out of your comfort zone. Yeah. And the Oscan Institute is trying to push students out of their comfort zone to put them in areas 
uh, that, that one developed them and stretched them. So in the context of, you, you know, we in the Army like to talk about lessons learned and after action and all that. When you were pushed out of your comfort zone, what are the, the positive and negative lessons that you learned yeah. as a function of, of mm. being pushed out of that zone? Yeah, there's, there's one example that really comes to mind for me is uh, I, uh, when I started with Boeing in the mid 80s, uh, I started up in uh, Seattle, which at that point was headquarters of, of the Boeing Corporation, and uh, worked up there for about 14 years. And I came to Boeing because I wanted to design airplanes. And I spent 14 years designing airplanes and just loved it. Every kind of airplane you can imagine. Um, and uh, I thought, boy, this, this can be a great career. I'm just going to do this for as long as I'm in the business. And uh, uh, at about the 15-year point in my career, uh, a senior leader in Boeing came to me and said, uh, Dennis, we had something else we want you to try. And I said, well, I'm in, I'm in the middle of this big airplane competition. I, I want to switch gears. I like what I'm doing. So we want you to go move to Washington, D.C. and run our uh, air traffic management business, a new startup. For Boeing said, so, well, I don't know a lot about air traffic management. I'm a fighter designer. Why do you want me to do that? He says, because it's going to stretch you and grow you. And uh, so I ended up, uh, this was uh, uh, September of uh, 2001, moved my family across the country from uh, Seattle to Washington, D.C. My wife and I um, had just had our first uh, son. He was maybe uh, two, three months old. And uh, I still remember driving from Seattle to Washington, D.C., we had seven pets. My wife is a veterinarian, so a U-Haul full of all our stuff and seven pets. And, and uh, we arrived in D.C., got moved in, got settled in. And about 10 days after we arrived, 9-11 uh, happened. Right? And uh, overnight, if, for those of you that remember the summer of 2001, the air traffic system was bursting at the seams. There was not enough capacity in the system. And overnight, the problem went from not enough capacity to not enough security, completely blew up our business model, dismantled the air traffic management business. Um, so I hear, I, you know, my wife's looking at me and said, we have a two-month-old son, moved across the country for what? <laughs> uh, so the, you know, the, that, was a, that was a very tough experience for me, and we had to kind of unravel that business model and um, some tough personnel issues to deal with. Uh, and that wasn't much fun while I was doing it. But looking back on that time period, I probably grew more as a leader during that year than any other time in my career. Because it pushed me outside of my comfort zone. I ended up meeting a whole bunch of new people in Washington, DC, dramatically expanded my network. I had a much more global understanding of the business and how it worked. Um, I eventually met people in DC like yourself, sir. Uh, and ended up, as my next job, taking over the Future Combat Systems program where we, we worked together. Um, so that move ended up being probably the absolute single most influential, important event in my career. And it was something that originally I didn't even want to do. So uh, that's one thing that stands out for me. You know, yeah. knowing you talk about airplanes, I was kind of hoping you were going to talk a little bit about something I have affinity for, and that's the rotary wing, yes. but that's, that, that's okay. Well, I love rotor birds, too. Yeah. I've flown in a lot of those, yeah. as you can imagine. I, I don't have to. You know this, but yep, you know, Boeing, I, I think, builds the best rotorcraft in the world. Absolutely. The Some best. of those right here in Philadelphia. Right, right here right. in Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> the, the best cargo aircraft built right here in Philadelphia the best attack helicopter built in Mesa, Arizona. The Apache. The yeah. Apache helicopter. Our troops really use these to the nth degree. Yeah, and, and not, not to go too far off track here, but it kind of ties back to this leadership theme. You know, I have had the privilege in this job of hearing so many stories from soldiers who talk about they were in a firefight and they heard the sound of the Apache and they knew it was going to be okay. Or people that got evac'd in a Chinook and they're alive today because they got, they got evac And boy, I tell you what, when you hear that from men and women who serve our country and who's, who are alive today because we had the privilege of building equipment for them, there's nothing more motivating than that. And, and, that, and that's what resonates with, with our team. And that's why I led you into that discussion because you've just heard what leadership is all about. It's caring for others. It's taking care of others. It's respect and it's taking care of your customer. That's leadership. That's the Boeing leadership model, by the way. 
Uh, in business, you know, when you think about the Oscan Institute, we talk about courage. And in business, generally, courage is moral courage rather than physical courage. Can, can you talk about some of those instances where you've had to, without going too, into too much detail, where you've had to display moral courage in making decisions? Yeah. Yeah, you know, one, one of the things we talk a lot about in our business is the importance of having integrity and character in the decisions we make. And I tell you what, in the business world, there are plenty of opportunities for you to cut a corner, maybe do something to gain competitive advantage. And I tell you, the, the pressure in today's industry is just immense. The competitive nature of what we do is, is incredible. And so the, the opportunity and the pressure to gain advantage by maybe not quite doing things to standard, that pressure is always there. And we tell our people this, there is no room, no room in what we do for compromising between performance and values. In fact, that's a false choice. If you're faced with something where somebody says, well, you can either do it the right way or you can do it to the way that's gonna gain advantage, that is a false choice. We have to be a business that performs with values. And uh, we, we remind ourselves of that a lot. And there's, you know, I think so many times about uh, pressures to get things done on cost and schedule and uh, uh, there's a lot of examples in, I'll go back to one in theater, I'm, I'm proud of one of our teams who helps run uh, Scan Eagle UAVs for the soldiers in theater. And uh, they run around the clock providing surveillance uh, eyes overhead for our soldiers. And uh, periodically things will come up where maybe there's an issue with a vehicle. Uh, I remember one last summer where we had a, an engine problem on one of the vehicles. And uh, there was pressure to go push it out into the field anyway, try to win a competition. And our guys stood back, I was so proud of them, said, you know what, people's lives depend on what we do. We're gonna go check this issue out, we're gonna resolve it, we're gonna do it the right way. That's what they did. And we ended up getting accolades from our customer because we did things the right way, and it ended up being good business for us too. And there's just so many examples I see where not compromising on values, doing it the right way, builds reputation with a customer and creates great business results. So those two have to go hand in hand. And the pressure of the business environment cannot lead you to make decisions that don't have integrity. We have way too many examples of where that happens in the business community, and, and we, we can't have that. We have to be a company that has a solid reputation and that has integrity in how we do our business. And, and, and certainly, uh, when you think about the traits and values that I, I enunciated tonight, Integrity is one of those that is so important in our business world. Yep. And we, we, we all understand the pressures that uh, the defense, defense industry is put under today and any industry is put up in this tremendously competitive environment. If, if you were to look at the students out here, the Oscan scholars, and say to them, here are the things that you ought to think about as you are trying to grow in whatever hmm. chosen profession you go in. What are those things that you would push them into? Not, not a functional area, but yeah. those, those tenets and principles that you would push them into yeah. as they think their way to moving forward. Yeah. Well, a, a couple of things, and I, I love the, the, the three words on the, on the uh, board back here, but I, I think uh, this idea of courage, um, to have the courage to go do something very significant. Don't underestimate what you can do. At, at this stage of your career, and with the investment that's been made in you as leaders, uh, to imagine big things, to, to think about world-changing things, and not to be limited by what people might say you can do, but to really think big. And especially early in your career, you, you can afford to take a big swing, right? And even if it doesn't go so well, you'll learn so much. So I, I'd encourage you to, to have the courage to think big and to really imagine uh, what you can do. And the competency piece of this, I think, is really important, right? That's the skills that go with it. Uh, but I think the, the character on top of that, that combination is what's really important. And I'd encourage you in, in today's uh, uh, business world, no matter what kind of business you might think about getting into, having character in how you lead is so important. And, and you know, I'm afraid, to, as I, you look at the media, there's just too many examples of bad character in business, and there's just no room for that. So think, think big about what you can do and really focus on having character in how you do it. 
And uh, not only be great at what you do, but how you do it. And uh, have a reputation as being a leader with character. I think that's what resonates so much with me when we talk with our military customers. We talk about the, the PMC heritage here at Widener. Um, at our Boeing Leadership Center, we have some joint activities we're doing with the service academies on developing leaders and this principle of character in leadership. I think it's a really fundamentally important one. And if you stick to that basic, you can be successful. When you, when you think about your career, is there one thing that stands out? I know there are many things that you should be proud of, but is there one thing that stands out that you can say to yourself, this, when I look in the mirror in the morning, this really makes me feel good about myself and what was done for our nation. Mm. <laughs> There's a lot of, uh, lot of examples I can think of where we've had the privilege of doing, doing uh, some great things for the country. You know, one that, that comes to mind, this will be a little bit close to home, is uh, when I was running uh, Future Combat Systems uh, for Boeing. And uh, for those of you not familiar with it, it was a, a program that started back in the 2003 time frame with the idea of equipping our ground soldiers with the most advanced technology in the world and get, giving them situational awareness and networking and robotic capabilities uh, to save lives in what had become a very difficult sort of asymmetric warfare environment. And uh, we, uh, we had developed some initial capabilities for networking and robotic uh, technologies that had been introduced into the field. And uh, one of these robots, called a, a PackBot, uh, was a robot that they would typically use to help uh, uh, defuse IEDs and uh, saved a lot of lives in, in theater. And I still remember getting a postcard from theater one day. And uh, we were all sitting at work, and every day uh, I have my uh, daily operations meeting. We'd start out in the morning, connect all the sites around the country, and walk through what are the, what's the game plan for today. So we had this postcard we showed everybody. And uh, the front of the postcard was just a picture. And, uh, it's a whole bunch of parts, one of our robots, and it was uh, all neatly laid out in the sand, just a photograph. I'm like, so somebody took apart one of our robots, and uh, I flipped it over and uh, had a handwritten message, and it said, uh, Dear Boeing, sorry, today, robot number, and it had the serial number of the robot on the card, uh, lost its life, comma, but it saved the lives of eight soldiers, right? and and. We, uh, we use that postcard in our meetings for about the next five years as a reminder of the significance of what we do. And it's one small example, but it was a really personal example of work we had done that there were eight soldiers alive today because of the work our team had done. And I can't think of anything more motivating to, to what that's, we do. That's a, that's a, tremendous, a tremendous story. And uh, you, I know you have a thousand stories of equipments that you've provided that have saved lives and provide us the edge on the battlefield. And Boeing does that every day and does it very well. You know, as, as those of us who've had the honor to lead organizations, whether we say them or think about them or in fact post them in our leadership philosophy, all, we, all have a motto mm. or a saying or a thought or a focus. Have you developed one of those, or do I have to go out and talk to the audience and ask, ask somebody? Well, one, one that hopefully, hopefully my team will recognize, uh, it's, uh, as we lay out our, our strategy for our company, uh, the first strategic objective, the foundational objective is what we call people first, customer always. And to me, that's a, that's a really important leadership principle. And it conveys that as a leader, the most important thing I can do is invest in my people first. Right? That's our priority. So mentoring, training, giving them opportunities, stretching, growing people. So why do we do that? This is, that's the customer always piece. Because we serve customers who have incredibly important missions. And whether it's the commercial or defense side of Boeing, we have commercial customers whose lives depend on airplanes that fly every time and fly well. Same number of landings as takeoffs, really important. Um, we have military customers whose missions are around the globe. Our national security depends on what we do. People's lives depend on what we do. So that demands a sense of excellence in how we do it. That's customer always. And that sense of excellence is why we invest in our people. So that people first, customer always connection, I think it's really important. And it's, it's foundational to how we run the business. It conveys our priorities as a business. 
and it guides all of our other decisions. Yeah. Well, thanks. I, I, I think uh, that, that's as good of a, a saying, if you were a model or an objective of any that I've heard. We also have not only students here, but we have faculty members from Widener. When, when you or your management team are looking to hire someone hmm. from a university, what are those char characteristics, traits, and aptitudes that you, you look for in an individual? Yeah. You talked about that earlier on, but could you elaborate on that for yeah. us? Well, I tell you, more and more, we're looking for leadership skills. Right? And I think in the, in the past, we generally hired a lot for competency. Right? We, we wanted to get the best experts in their field of study. You know, top grade point averages, top technical capacity, and, that, and that's important. But that's now become more of a, that's sort of an initial filter that says, yeah, you have to be competent at what you do. We, we want to hire the best, the most capable talent. But that talent has to come with a leadership capacity. And so we're looking for people who uh, have the ability to operate in teams, not just fly solo. Uh, people who have a global perspective and can understand that there's value in having diversity in a team. That a team that brings different ideas and thoughts and backgrounds to the table is much better than a team that just brings one set of ideas to the table. Uh, so somebody with global perspective. Uh, somebody who, who really demonstrates character and integrity in what they do. And uh, not only do they have a great academic record, but they have a record of, in, of doing other things in the community, of giving back to the community. That uh, they show they have that breadth and insight and desire to do more than just the academic piece. So that's the kind of well-rounded leader that we're looking for in the future. And th those are the kind of people that we see uh, succeeding. And uh, we also try to, once, once we have those, those kind of people in Boeing, to accelerate their, their uh, development. And as we make leadership and promotional decisions inside the company, to also do that based on leadership. And uh, I think that's a really important principle. So more and more, that's, that's what we're looking for in terms of talent uh, coming out of the universities. Well, I guess, I, guess uh, I would just ask for a follow on on that before I open it up for Q's and A's. And I know some folks have some questions they'd like to ask. But, but what, is, what, what is the development process in Boeing from the standpoint of, we know different organizations have different developmental models. Yeah. What's the developmental model in Boeing for someone that they see really has the spark yeah. to move forward? Yeah. Well, we have, uh, we've developed what we call a, a long-range people plan. So it, it kind of encapsulates that what I'll call life cycle development of an employee. And without going too deep into it, 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 it starts, one, with attracting talent to, to the kind of things we do. So our, our whole uh, STEM initiative to get kids interested in science and technology careers. Uh, and then working with universities on things like internships and helping uh, graduates be successful and getting them into the business. Now, once they're in Boeing, uh, that program includes rotation programs early on. I know I met one uh, student earlier tonight who was an intern at Boeing, and then uh, uh, there he is, and now is entering the BCFP program, the Boeing Career Foundation program, which is a, a rotational program where in two years you get a breadth of assignments across the company. Uh, and then uh, uh, pulling them through to mid-level leadership positions, uh, investing in a, a, a number of programs around first-line leadership, developing core leadership capabilities, and then senior executive programs that help accelerate leadership and also create mentoring skills where our senior uh, folks have a responsibility to connect with the incoming workforce, create mentoring relationships. It's valuable for knowledge transfer, knowledge management, and also creates pull-through through that life cycle pipeline. So the idea that at every stage of a career, uh, you've, got a, you've got a game plan for how you're going to develop, grow, and stretch people. And a lot of that we, uh, we uh, run through our Boeing Leadership Center as a, as a core part of what our company's about. That, that, that parallels many, many programs that I'm familiar with, and I think, yeah. <laughs> I think it's, a, it's a program that, in, in my mind's eye, causes people to succeed rather than fail. And, and I congratulate you. And, and Boeing for that. 
So at, at this point, uh, let's uh, turn the lights up and see if we have any questions out there. Uh, I know there were some, and I'll try to point to the folks who have questions. Uh, if I were going to answer the questions, I'd say ask general questions, and there are questions that generals can answer. But in this case, you can answer any. <laughs> <laughs> you can answer, ask any question you like. Do I have anyone who has a question out there? Yeah, right here at this table, right here, this gentleman. <clears throat> And now I like I like to do these. If you could introduce yourself, maybe tell me what you do, and how about where you're from, just to add some personal interest. Well, first of all, my name's <clears throat> excuse me, Doug Williamson. I'm up at the Ridley plant. I've been up there 27 years. I'm second of three generations in the Ridley plant, and uh, I'm an employee involvement facilitator for the union up there. I'm a union guy up there, which I think I'm the only one in here. So. But in regards to that, you know, in our place, we have a, a veteran workforce. And the ideas that you're bringing, how do we do a better job, at, at me as a union leader, cascading that message down to our folks? Because, you know, we have a, a cohort of older folks and in a cohort of younger folks that have come on over the last yep. five years. That message will reach them, but these other guys still have 15 to 20 years to go. How can we engage them better? Yeah. Well, I, I think it, it goes back to what we were talking about in terms of understanding that as a, as a part of the team, you have a greater responsibility than just taking care of yourself and your own career. And uh, I think what you've seen in the EI area, employee involvement areas, um, when that culture takes hold on the floor, so this is a real sense of ownership of, of, and sense of team in how we do our business, and that uh, if somebody needs help, we're going to help them, and that at every stage of our career, we have a responsibility to do that. And our experienced workforce has a responsibility to create pull through and to mentor and to help the next generation succeed. Those in the middle of the workforce uh, can, can help create that same kind of pull through. And uh, I think it's just, it's, it's this idea of having uh, individual responsibility to not just work your own career, but to help those around you and help your team succeed. Thank you. You know what you said about employee involvement. It's amazing because for the, for the folks that have been here a while, you know, we thought our plant was going to close. Yeah. And we came in and we made some significant changes. We em employed employee involvement and everybody pulled together because we wanted to stay working at Boeing. And we turned our plant into one of the top producers. Yep. That's what business. happens when it takes hold in the culture. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you. Right here, sir. Right at this table here. Hi. My name is Dave Lansbury and uh, I work at Boeing, but my question is more on leadership. Um, my question is more, how do you balance, as a leader, uh, personal and leadership um, as your hierarchy has grown over the years? You talked about the most challenging year that you had when you moved from Seattle to Washington and being uh, a young guy with a family. And um, I always uh, question how a person does that and, yeah. and how you, how you, uh, what that challenge is and how you, you know, how you yeah. approach that. No, great, great question. And, you know, it's, I think it's really important to understand that that has to be a priority in your thought process, right? As a leader, uh, I can't be a good leader at work if I'm not a good leader at home, right? Um, and so, you know, I have, I have two uh, young children. I have an 11-year-old son, Luke, and an 8-year-old daughter, Amy. And uh, they're just wonderful, wonderful kids. And uh, I think about that has to be a priority for me. And, and you know, it can't, work can't take the place of being a father and a husband. And in fact, if I don't have good balance there, I'm not going to be very good at work either. Right? So this idea that uh, having the right balance is an important part of being solid at work, making that personal and leadership connection. It's an important principle, and my wife and I have spent a lot of time talking about that and what is the right balance, and I think it's probably a different answer for everybody in the room here, but my usual advice on that is, you know, have a plan, and, uh, you know, my plan is I don't come into the office on the weekends unless it's natural uh, disaster or, you know, national emergency, and I think the past year that was maybe two weekends out of the year. That's an important principle. Uh, if I can be home at night instead of doing an overnight, do a day trip, you know, it seems simple. But being home at night to see my kids uh, instead of staying overnight in some other city, it's really important. 
tonight after this event, I'm flying back to St. Louis. I'm going to see my kids tonight before, uh, before they hit the sack. They're going to stay up a little late, but I'm going to see them, right? So, um, you know, that's kind of our game plan. Uh, and it's important to have a plan is the point, because if you don't have a plan, uh, the business can soak up every single minute you have. I could work 24 hours a day, no problem, and keep plenty busy, and uh, I'd probably be a lousy leader as a result. So have a plan. Yeah. Right over here, sir, in this corner. Yeah. Yeah, I got to think back. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I tell you what, I uh, I spent uh, 18 years on my uh, on my dad's farm. We had uh, it's about a 250 acre farm in Iowa. Uh, corn, soybeans, alfalfa, lots of cows, pigs, chickens. Uh, long hours, hard work. I remember thinking back then, I said, boy, this is a really tough way to make a living. Maybe I ought to get into the airplane business. <laughs> uh, I think you know, that was part of the thinking that was going on then. Um, I, uh, growing up in Iowa, we, we didn't travel a lot. Just business you know, requires a lot of attention every day. Um, so I hadn't had a chance to see a lot of the country and a lot of the world. And I had a desire to do that. And uh, I think that's part of what led me to think about a, a business that had kind of a global nature to it. Um, and I, and I really remember just my dad, he didn't, he didn't spend a lot of time talking about it. It was more by example, but uh, uh, the idea that you know, hard work is a good thing. It's a good thing. Discipline, uh, integrity, do what you say you're going to do. Get your chores done when you're supposed to get them done. You know. uh, I think some of those fundamental principles just kind of stuck, stuck with me. So I tell my kids it's... Uh, I wish I could get him out to the farm. I, I tell my 11-year-old son, you know, I ask him to do his chores and take the garbage out. You know, when I was your age, I did this. Right? I said, wait, I'm starting to sound like my dad. But uh, you know, when I was, I was your age, I was out at 5 in the morning milking the cows. And, and uh, he said, Dad, no way. <laughs> but I, I think there's something to those, those hard work principles that you learn on a farm that just uh, kind of stuck with me. We have time for one more question. I'd like to give an Oscan scholar the opportunity to ask a question if we have one back here who wants to ask a question. Okay. In the back? Please stand up and... Hi. Uh, my name is Mamadou Keita. I'm a French and international relations major here at Widener University. And um, I'm very interested about the uh, idea of character. I know I dis uh, we discuss this a lot with, uh, in our leadership class with Dr. Schwartz and all. What does it take for young students like me uh, to really build up this strong character to be able to lead uh, in the world? Or, you know, just character as a whole, what does it take for uh, people like us to really build it uh, from a young age? And, yeah. Well, I, I think the first step in that process is exactly what you're doing, right? It's the fact that as a leader, you're thinking about it, right? That it matters. It's a priority to understand that leadership includes character, that, that the two can't be apart. You can't be a leader without having character. So I think coming to that realization is really important and making it a priority. And that's, that's why I love what's going on here is because it's this idea that uh, we can we can teach and develop and grow leadership as a skill, character in leadership as, as a core part of what we do. And that ought to be part of our academic background, part of our training, part of what we're about as an individual. And uh, you know, something like anything else, if you want to be good at it, you've got to practice it. You've got to live it. You've got to work on it every day. Um, I, I think that's what it's about. And that sounds kind of simple, but making it a priority making it a principle of how you live, uh, making it part of who you are as an individual, that character is important, it matters, right? It matters not just for you, but it, it matters for 
your family, your children, if you have children someday, right? It's something you can pass along. It's something that uh, doesn't stop, right? Other things go away. I, I think the quote you mentioned earlier about wealth going away, not a big deal. Health going away, well, it, not a great thing, but character goes away, that's, that's everything, right? So having that headset as a leader, the character really matters and that it's something that's long lasting. I, I think that's, just being cognizant of that is, is what's important. At this that, time. That was our last question. I'd like to, uh, before I turn it back to Arthur, is one, thank all of the Boeing people here tonight for what you do for our service people. I would just tell you. <laughs> and secondly, we are honored to have Dennis as our 2012 <laughs> Voice of Leadership honoree. What, what a great uh, you. honor you have paid us tonight by being here and paid me personally as a friend. Yeah, Thank the you honor's mine, much. sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, if you could stay up here, I, I invite President Harris and Mr. Oskin to the stage for the presentation of the Widener Bugle. Uh, as many of you know, the Widener Bugle is a centerpiece of American military history. The bugle was utilized as the singular call to arms from the American Revolution to the Civil War. Today, calling people to action is a defining quality of a leader. The university and the Oskin Leadership Institute presents you, Dennis, with the Widener Bugle in honor of your achievement in answering the call to lead both the employees of Boeing Defense, Space, and Security but also the security of our nation. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank everyone. I want to thank uh, General Tulelli for his fine job of narrating to, or moderating this evening. And also I want to thank uh, Mr. Muhlenberg for your wonderful comments. You honored us by being here. Thank you for being here this evening. Please come back to our campus. Maybe come back on a nice fall afternoon. Two weeks from now we play our arrival on a Saturday afternoon. We're undefeated in the nation, so if you're ranked in the top ten, so come back and see a football game and enjoy the college spirit. Come back and join us in a classroom. But whatever you do, please come back to our campus. Great having you here. Have a great night.